All right, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, I apologize. Father Matthew set me up for failure because he said that this was going to be a, a very enlightening discussion. I don't know that I'm going to enlighten much of anything, but uh, I will. I'm happy to offer some some thoughts. Some of um, this is a, this is a subject that I, that's very near and dear to my family and to my my heart, and I'd love to share a little bit of this with everyone here. And I'm going to try to keep it a little bit loosely structured, and I'd love to turn this into some a little bit more interactive towards the end and ask if there are any questions. Um, I know that there are a lot of people in this room from across a really broad spectrum of backgrounds and experience with the church. There are people who have been Orthodox for, for you know, eight decades, and there are people who are hoping to be Orthodox in another eight months kind of thing. So we've got a very, very broad spectrum. Um, but I'm going to be talking about monasticism specifically in the context of Athenite monasticism as it is well, well, a little bit of history of Athenite monasticism and how that then is impacting orthodoxy in America today through the legacy of St. Joseph the Hesychast and the Elder Ephraim. So I'm going to start with just a very brief timeline where I'm going to talk about monasticism in general. I apologize if this is overview or review for uh, many of you. but. In the early history of the church, there were the first centuries of Christian persecution. During that time, there were often people that were looking to try to seek a little bit more of the spiritual life that would go out to the desert and, and live in fairly secluded, uh, somewhat secluded lives. But towards the end of this period, this became actually formalized under, the, under what we would usually consider the patronage of, of St. Anthony the Great. St. Anthony is considered the father of monasticism. He was the, the first person to really formalize this eremitic way of life. The eremitic way of life meaning specifically going out into the desert and living as a hermit, living by oneself in, in the desert, far from the world, and trying to engage in extra ascetical efforts to, to fight again, to struggle against the passions and to attain, attain godliness. And this is, this is a very common theme that we'll see throughout some of the, a lot of these discussions, that monasticism in general, this is a retreat from the world, a getting away from a lot of the secular ideas, and in, in not just a metaphorical, but in a literal, physical way, removing oneself from, from society. And through, these are generally considered the three kind of tenets of ascetical discipline, fasting, prayer, and vigil. These monastics, St. Anthony as the first leader, were, were the ones who kind of set this up for, for, for the rest of, of the, the church today. So St. Anthony we talk about as the father of monasticism. As I mentioned, he sort of founded the Eremitic way of life. One of his disciples, St. Pacomius, who was... Um, like I said, he was, he was one of the, the, the monks who came and lived near St. Anthony. So St. Anthony was living in the west of Alexandria in the desert of Egypt. And it ended up being a place that many, many other people were drawn to this way of life and sort of start, started to follow. And also lived in these scattered um, huts and caves, whatever, throughout the desert. And eventually St. Pacomios decided to formalize this by founding what's, what we call the Kenobium, or the Cenobitic monastic way of life. This is the form of monasticism that maybe some of us are more familiar with. This is where there's going to be um, the monks living in a community. Everything is held by the monastery. And there's a single abbot who divides tasks and assigns the monks of what they are, what they are to do. But whether we're talking about the Eremitic or the Cenobitic style of monasticism, Again, the principles are the same, this idea of self-denial and of ascetical labors in order to overcome the, the bodily passions and to uh, be, closer, be, cl be closer to God. Monasticism involves a renunciation of a number of things. You probably have heard things like, for example, taking the vows. This is a common thing in, in Western monasticism where people take the vows of obedience and poverty and, and celibacy. So monastics do not marry, they pledge their lives to God. 
And there are other ascetical disciplines. So for example, monastics it, in most traditions, in most Orthodox traditions, never eat meat as well. They also have additional fasting where they fast, for example, not just on Wednesdays and Fridays, but also on Mondays and often other times during the year. And monastic, monasticism as a result has been, has evolved to be looked to by the rest of the church as what we would consider our ideal. When we read it in the Gospels and also in the epistles of St. Paul, it's repeatedly mentioned that this idea of being able to, to dedicate oneself entirely to God is the ideal, not to marry, to be able to, to, to be in, in single um, uh, focus on God. And this is even what the word monachos, monastic means, it comes that mono alone, is referring to the fact that each person is struggling on their own, of course under, under the guidance of, a, of an abbot office, but it's this idea that, that this person is undertaking this on their own without entering into the monastic, uh, sorry, into the married life. And as a result of this, the church has again recognized the beauty and importance of monasticism, such that even from starting in the in the fourth century, it became standard, and then later was, I believe, canonically even codified, that all of our hierarchs in the church actually come from monasteries. And we see this in a number of great examples of bishops in our church. St. John Chrysostom, for example, was a monastic in, in Asia Minor, in and around Ephesus, and he was actually taken from his monastery forcibly by the people and installed as their bishop because they recognized his intense uh, spirituality that was acquired through this, through this discipline. And not just St. John Chrysostom, but we have many, many other monastic saints throughout the centuries. God was the sanctified. We have, of course, St. John of the Ladder, who wrote The Ladder of Divine Ascent, a seminal work of Orthodox spirituality. St. John of Damascus, who wrote many works of theology and who is, who along with St. Theodore the Studite are especially relevant today on the Sunday of Orthodoxy because they were instrumental in um, in, in defending the iconodulic, the, the, the worship of Christ with the veneration of icons during the iconoclast struggles of the, uh, of the 8th century. Now, all of these early fathers, so St. Anthony, uh, Pacomio Saba, St. John of the Latter, Saint, these were, and, and St. John of Damascus, all lived in the Egyptian and Palestinian deserts. These were, in a very literal sense, withdrawing from the world, going into the desert. As with the expansion of Islam in the, Ara in the Arabian and Afri North African regions, a lot of the center of monastic spirituality shifted a little bit more towards being, part, being in more ingrained and integral to the Byzantine Empire. And this is where we have, for example, the Monastery of Sudian, where St. Theodore was, which was founded by Justinian, I believe, in the 5th in the fifth, uh, fifth century. Um, but it, it really rose to prominence much later in time, as just unfortunately, by reality, a lot of the importance of these monasteries in Palestine and Egypt had, had their influence dwindled because of the, the Islamic um, expansion. But not... So during this first thousand years of the church, monasticism really was outside, it was in these other areas, and not in what we often think of today when we hear about monasticism, and that is specifically Mount Athos. St. Athanasius the Athanite was a courtier in the, in the imperial court in Byzantium, in, in Constantinople, and was good friends with the emperor, and when he decided to become a monk, he requested permission and a charter from the emperor to set aside an area near Constantinople that would be just dedicated to the practice of monasticism. And the emperor, a good friend of his, granted that and gave him Mount Athos. Now Mount Athos, we, we, Mount Athos makes you think it's a mountain. It's actually a peninsula in northeastern Greece. You can see the little, the little red there. I apologize, the project was pretty pixelated. But it's this peninsula in northeastern Greece that is home at the present day to 20 different monasteries and a number of smaller monastic communities. The entire, um, the entire, sorry, the entire peninsula 
per the charter of the emperor, is dedicated just to monasticism. So it is a semi-autonomous republic. It's governed by it internally. Um, and it's also off limits to women. These are, this is a male-only monastery monastic republic. In order to give um, us men who suffer from a lot of proclivities toward temptation, a place to be able to dedicate ourselves fully to, uh, to spiritual struggle without distractions. So, Saint, Saint Athanasius was the, was, was the first one who got this, and it, like I said, it's Mount Athos, it's called Mount Athos because of the, the mountain at the end of this peninsula, that mountain peak is Athos, and it's pretty hard probably to see here, but there's a little clearing kind of on the face of there. By the way, we're looking, I don't know if you can see it, but there, the three peninsulas that are there, you can kind of see them one after another. There's a little clearing here, do I have, a, do I have a pointer on there? Yeah, so there's a little clearing here, and that's actually where the monastery is that St. Athanasius founded. He, he built it way at the end of the peninsula to be as, as secluded and remote as possible. And this is the monastery of Great Lavra, which exists to, to today. This was founded in 963, and actually the giant cedar that you can see here next to the church this was planted by St. Athanasius himself, so this, is, this tree is over a thousand years old. And this kind of gives you a, a scale of what the monasteries look like. They're these large, almost fortress structures built for many, many people to, to live in and be protected. Of course, in that, in that era, there were pirates, there were other things that needed to be needed protection against, but you see the church in the center and then all of these buildings around, and there are several, you can see other little huts and chapels and such in, the, in, in this area. Many, many, many monastics came to live with St. Athanasius under his guidance. And it wasn't just at, um, at the Monastery of Great Lavra, but other monasteries on Mount Athos. So we have the Monastery of, of Simonopatera, for example. There were very quickly many other monasteries founded here. Grigorio um, uh, is another one. And then not just Greek monasteries, too. We have Iviron here on the top right. We have uh, Hilandar on the bottom right. These were founded by the, by the Georgians and by the, uh, the Serbians. And these monasteries you can also see are in a variety of different places, up high on the cliffs, down by the water, in the flatter <coughs> areas. This monastery here of Hilandar on the bottom right is, in, is inland. So a lot of different monasteries, all very big, uh, just huge, these, there was this flourishing of the monastic communities of Athos. And so we see in the first part of the second millennium that Athos kind of becomes the focal point of monasticism throughout the Orthodox world. Now, for those who know world history, of course, the second millennium was not entirely kind to uh, the Orthodox Church. And so even though there, at the very, at the beginning, through the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, there were these um, great luminaries of, of monasticism, and so we had St. Gregory Palamas, but then after that, with the Ottoman occupation, there was this. Uh, there, there was a lot of a, a lot of difficulty in the that the, the was faced in that part of the world, and so a lot of Athenite monasticism ended up spreading to other places. There were people that would leave Athos due to the persecutions of the Ottomans and go and found monasteries elsewhere, including not just the the Greek diaspora, but also in Romania, Wallachia, in in Russia, in Ukraine, un, in other places. But Athos still remained in many both both metaphorically and, um, I, I mean, not just, it, it really did be, maintain its position as the focal point of Orthodox monasticism. And in the 19th century, we had these, we had a, a somewhat of a, of a rebirth of monasticism under the guidance of various saints, including Nicodemus and, and the Hagiorite and his friend Macarius of Corinth, uh, the Kolibadis fathers as they're known, but not just the Greeks. There was also St. Paisius uh, This There was this rebirth of emphasis on spirituality, on getting back to uh, what is the purpose of monasticism. And I mentioned St. Gregory Palamas in particular because he's going to become relevant when we're talking later on. St. Gregory in the, in the 14th century was a firm proponent of, uh, a strong proponent of hesychasm, which is the practice of silence and inner, con inner contemplation and inner prayer. And 
this was uh, not a novel idea, but he was the one that wrote a lot of things that kind of formalized a lot of these practices. He was himself a, a monk and then an abbot on Mount Athos before he became the bishop of, of Thessaloniki, and his writings and teachings were also very instrumental in guiding St. Nicodemus and these other people in the, in the 18th century and the 19th century to try to help revitalize and, and give this rebirth to, uh, to Orthodox monasticism, uh, Athenite monasticism in particular. Thanks to their efforts and uh, the grace of God, there was a rebirth of <coughs> monasticism on Athos, and this was especially true due to the support also of Tsarist Russia. And so in the, when I talk about these ebbs and flows of, of the monasticism, most recently, if we talk about just over a hundred years ago, right before the Bolshevik Revolution, Athos was uh, at its, that was probably the height of, of Athenite monasticism, at least in terms of numbers, with roughly 10,000 monks living on the peninsula. And just to give an illustration of how quickly that was impacted by the geopolitical events of the Bolshevik Revolution and shutting down of the, the you know, of the borders with the various Soviet states, and also continued struggles with between Greece and Turkey and the impoverishment that, that occurred also with World War I. Just a few decades later, in the, the, the mid-20th century, the number of monks went from 10,000 down to about to under 500. Um, so this was partly because many of these monastics went back to try to minister to, their, to, to people in these areas that were suffering and many of those who went back to Russia and other areas that fell under the Soviet sphere, of course, never returned. But it's in this, it's within this uh, landscape that we introduce the, the first person that's going to be really relevant to our talk about today, and that is Elder Joseph the Hezekast. Born just before the turn of the century, growing up in, he was born in, a, as a, in a, a very poor family in a small village, a fishing, fishing village on the island of Paros. His family was very poor. He was the sixth of nine children. The first three died in infancy. And his father died when he was in fourth grade. So he had to drop out of school and, and try to help with, uh, with supporting his family. When he was a young teenager, he moved to Athens to try to find work because of how the, the state of the economy there in Paros. And while living there, he originally was, he was, he was not, I don't want to say he wasn't a church-going person, but he had some events where he encountered various people and that caused him to have kind of this turning back towards Christ. And at the age of 23, he, 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 and he met several monastics, monastics including uh, one nun, who in particular was very instrumental in kind of helping him feel a calling towards the ascetic and the monastic life. And Athos at this time, so you can imagine this is in, in 1920, 1920, 1920, somewhere in there. So this is shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution and already the monasteries had felt very significantly the impacts. Um, one of the monasteries in Athos, for example, Pandelebonos, had, had roughly 2,000 monks in it. It was a Russian monastery, had about 2,000 monks and they were actually, they, um, they, basically the monastery was almost entirely depopulated within, within a decade or two. So this is, the, this is the setting again within which that Elder Joseph moves as a young man to Mount Athos, which is still, like I said, the focal point of monasticism, both historically, but even in a continued practical sense. But when he went there, it was, it was definitely undergoing a very rapid decline. The nun who had first introduced him to the spiritual life and to the monastic calling, I believe was either brothers or cousins or something with, a, with an elder in the unknown Athos, Elder Daniel of Kapanaikia. And she encouraged Elder Joseph, then Francis, to go to meet him. And he did. He went there to Katanake, which I'm gonna I'm gonna show a, a, a picture of that. Actually, I can just skip straight to that. I don't know if you guys can see this here, but um, the 
I'll see if I can zoom in and maybe that gives a better sense. These are huts, these are houses. This is a modern picture, of course. These are houses built on the cliffs, on these rugged cliffs in a very secluded, very remote part of Mount Athos. In fact, there are areas in this part of, the, of Mount Athos where there are chains that are drilled into, with bolts drilled into the rock. It's the only way that you can get up and down the cliffs safely. And there are people who, this is where monks go in order to be as remote and as secluded as possible because what they are trying to achieve again <coughs> is that same sense of removal from the world and being able to focus on this Hesychast way of life. Hence, St. Joseph the Hesychast. Hesychast, from the Greek word isihia, meaning silence. And he would struggle, he struggled in, in Hesychasm and in asceticism in order to try to discipline himself and bring his passions, his sins under control. And he did this in not just what we might think of as normal asceticism, but really intense asceticism. He, just some examples. When he first went to Mount Athos, he wanted to find an, an elder. He wanted to, to, he was looking around to find someone who would only eat every other day. So this is the classical monastic practice to only eat food and only in the evenings on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday to eat nothing whatsoever on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And this is what he, this is, when he went there, that's what he wanted to focus on. They would, he and he found a fellow monastic, Father Arsenios, and they would spend all night praying. During Great Lent, they would, from Sunday evening until Saturday morning, basically during the entire week, they would not speak. Literally, they would not speak any words. If there was an absolute necessity, they might make a hand gesture but they would not speak in order to focus on this. Um, and so, again, he went with the intention of just trying to focus on asceticism and acquiring noetic prayer. Noetic prayer being the, the focusing on the Jesus prayer and praying that internally with one's noose, which the fathers describe as being the, the portion of, the, of, our, of our soul that is in communication with God. So St. Joseph really focused for decades on this. And over the years, as he progressed in spirituality, other monastics began to identify him as a spiritual guide. He did not publicize much of this at all. In fact, it's interesting, there's a, there's a contemporary account by another monk, um, Archimandre Kemuvim, if you ever get a chance to, to read his books, uh, I don't know if we have them in the bookstore here, the, the Contemporary Aesthetics of Mount Athos, or um, there's also Toperi um, Bolitz I don't know if we have that, okay. Uh, beautiful works, but he talks, this was also a, a monk in the, living on Athos in the 30s, and he says, we knew it, that up in the cliff, in the cave there, that's where Elder Joseph lived with his small group, and that they practiced Hezekiah, but we didn't know anything about them because they never came out only one monk might come down, you know, to get supplies, and they never spoke to us. And it was not, he describes, he said, it wasn't until later that we found out the, the heights of spirituality that this man had attained. But again, St. Joseph, is, there, there were people that he had contact with, and slowly over the years, a small group of monastics formed around him. Several of these monastics are people that you might be familiar with if you're if you know about some of the the work here in america i'm going to introduce a few of them so this little group of, of monastics here we have of course elder joseph himself here in the center sitting next to father arsenios these were the first two that that kind of co-founded their their little brotherhood and they would do obedience to each other they would each treat the other one as as sort of the, the abbot and to make sure that they were sub in constant submission Father Athanasios back here is actually Elder Joseph's uh, biological brother. He came from the, the world to join St. Joseph. And the three other ones that I've highlighted here, Father Paranos, Father Joseph the Younger, and Father Ephrem, these are important because these three later became very instrumental in a lot of other work, both on Mount Athos and abroad. Father Ephrem, spoiler alert, this is Elder Ephrem, the one who founded the monastery in Arizona. Um, Father, and so we'll talk about Father Paralogos and, and little Father Joseph as well. But this brother with this group of between seven and ten months, depending on, on, on the year, 
lived in these tiny little huts. Uh, I've been here to this, this little place. You, this is the little chapel that they would meet in. There were this tiny little, not even a cave, it's just kind of an, a, 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 you know, a little hollow under this outcropping of the rock. And that's where they had their chapel. That's where they had two other little buildings that they would use for their, for their cells. And they would sit up here um, and just looking out over the sea and just engage in prayer and focus on their discipline of, of their, their, their monastic ideals. And this is how they lived for years. Father Ephraim, Elder Ephraim here, um, went to, to Mount Athos in 1947 as a 19-year-old boy. And he went to join Elder Joseph the Hezekast, whom he had heard about in passing from, a, from another priest monk who was in his hometown of Bolos. And he went and joined the monastery, or joined this brotherhood, like I said, at, at the age of 19 in, 19 in 1947. Twelve years later, in 1959, is when Elder Joseph Hezekast finally re reposed. He was not very old, again, so he was 62 at that point. But due to his extreme asceticism, he had suffered a lot in his health. And he had always chosen these areas, like we showed here, these areas that were very rugged, very exposed, um, and exposed also to, of course, the extremes of the weather. And so between that and then living here in this area of Mithiayan, a small St. Anne's, uh, the, the health of all of the monastics and the brotherhood suffered. Eventually they moved down to an area called Musit, and there all of the rest of the monks eventually regained their health except for Elder Joseph, who eventually passed away in 1959. When he died, again, the brotherhood was not, um, it, 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 was, it was a small brotherhood still, but Elder Joseph had given them permission to go and, after his death, to go and start their own little little building, their own little cells, their own little brotherhoods. Um, again, not in a, oh yeah, you should go start a monastery, but he gave them permission to go, and eventually, due to their interactions with others and people recognizing their sanctity and their spirituality, several monks began gathering around some of these young monks, especially Father Paralogos, Father Joseph and Father Ephraim, all of whom were all, all of whom were priest monks. And Father Ephraim in particular, I want to talk about him, not to discount from the other two, but because he's the kind of the, the main architect of our story. Father Ephraim eventually uh, had a, a group of, of many monastics gather around him, and they were living in these tiny little buildings. They would they, they just would ask to uh, move into some of these ruined houses and just live there and try to fix them up. And then, of course, more monastics would come and join. So it was two, and then it was five, and it was ten, and then it was twenty. And as I mentioned, <clears throat> Athenite monasticism at this point, again, in the mid-20th century, had undergone this massive decline. There's a, um, there's a picture book that, that, that we have, The Miracle on the Monastery Mountain. I think it's out on the, on the coffee table, and I encourage you to go through there, because there's some beautiful pictorial uh, represent, a capturing of, of some of what how things how things progressed through the through the 20th century but father Ephraim in particular at that time the reason i'm bringing this up is because of the 20 monasteries on mount athos many if not most of them had fallen into in, into disuse and even close to ruin so there was one monastery in particular the monastery of Philotheo, which i'm showing here now this is how it looks today actually it looks even nicer than this because they've done some further renovation but in, 19, in 1973, um, Father Ephraim was asked to come and become the abbot here with his small group of 20 monks, because at that point there were only six monks left living there and they were all in their, in their 70s. Um, they were all elderly and they recognized that the monastery would just die off completely without new blood. So Father Ephraim came here with his group. And of course, at that point, being one of the official 20 monasteries of Mount Athos, they had a lot more visibility, many more monks started to come there, and eventually the same story repeated itself. More and more monks came, they didn't have enough space, uh, conveniently, providentially, there were other monasteries that needed an influx of new blood, and so from Filotheu, three other monasteries, Karakalu, Sirupotamu, and Konstantinitu, three, so four out of the, the 20 monasteries on Mount Athos, that had fallen into complete decline were repopulated by Elder Ephraim. 
And I mentioned those other two monastics under Elder Joseph, so Father Joseph the Younger and Father Paralamos. And between the two of them, they also repopulated two other monasteries, Dionisio and Batupedi, which had also fallen into great decline. So all six of these monasteries really owe their present spiritual lineage directly back to Elder Joseph the Hezekas. But we don't just stop with Greece, of course. You know this, um, because outside Greece, Elder Ephraim has also had an impact here in America. So we talked about Elder Ephraim being the abbot of Philotheu in, starting in 1973. Later on, I believe in 1979 was his first trip, and then throughout the 80s, as people would come to him for spiritual guidance and confession, they would ask if he could travel to visit them in other places, both in mainland Greece, but then again further abroad, in Canada, New York, Australia, to, especially to visit people who were not able either through health, uh, physical, physically incapable of traveling, or to also come and visit their, their families. You know, the, the women can't go to Mount Athos, and they would ask him to come and give spiritual talks. Throughout the 80s, Elder Ephraim ended up coming to America more and more frequently and recognizing the intense need of monasticism in the church here. We talked about how monasticism was the light of the church in the first millennium, it was recognized that the monastics were the leaders of the church. There's, a, there's an expression in the patristic writings that says that the light of men is the monks, and the light of, of monks is angels. I guess it goes around uh, the other way around. So God is the light of the angels, the angels are the light of the monks, and the monks, the monastics, are the light of those of us in the world. Um, and so Elder Ephraim, came, in addition to these four monasteries that he repopulated on Mount Athos, came to America and founded 17 monasteries here, uh, about half men, uh, uh, male, so half men's monasteries and half women's convents. For the convents, he also had several convents in Greece that had similarly been groups of monastics who wanted to be under his direction. And so from those monasteries, as they grew and expanded and outgrew their physical plant, he brought them here to America. And so of these monasteries now, seven, these 17 monasteries scattered all over the country, um, I, the, the, many of these monasteries follow a very similar trajectory. One, two, three monks are brought from a place to start, and then they expand. If you've ever been to Goldendale, you know the story from there. Three nuns has turned into something like 30 today. Elder Ephraim himself ended up uh, retiring to, in 1991, he resigned his position as the abbot of Philotheo. He gave it to and, and uh, appointed a, a successor, and he came to Arizona, or came to America full-time. And in 1995, he founded the monastery St. Anthony the Great. This is in uh, the desert about an hour south of Phoenix. So this monastery, like I said, um, founded in 1995. This is the abbot here, Archimedes Paisios. The monastery grew from originally four monastics, um, which was just one monk and three novices, one of whom ended up deciding not to pursue monasticism, so only three people originally, uh, and then a few other monks that came from Greece, but now they have about 50 monastics. And from that 50, there were also, again, about a half dozen other monasteries throughout America, where two or three monks would be sent out to start and then grow other monasteries. The monastery is in the it has expanded in terms of physical plant. It has a, a number of, of beautiful chapels. You can see some of these different places. Uh, one of the chapels, the one here that you can see in the foreground of the big picture at the top, this is actually where Elder Ephraim, when he passed away in December of 2019, this is where he is, his tomb is inside, is under the ground of the chapel there. You actually can see that down here on the bottom right. Um, I don't know how visible that is to everybody. But this is, this is Elder Ephraim's tomb here in the little chapel of St. Minas. The monastery follows a, a pretty rigorous schedule to, in order to try to provide any of the pilgrims and the visitors there with a taste of the monastic life. When I say rigorous schedule, I mean that they are up, the services start at, I believe, 1.30 in the morning every day. The monks themselves get up at 10 or 11 p.m. Uh, and are in personal prayer for several hours. Then they gather in the church for the morning prayers, which will be midnight office and matins and the liturgy. So this happens every day. They finish around 4 a.m. They go back to their cells to rest a little bit. And then starting in the early morning, 7, 8 o'clock, they get up and start doing their chores throughout the day. And then again, there's vespers in the evening every day at 3.30, vespers, a, a, a dinner, and then compline, and everybody returns to their rooms. 
So this is a way, this is a, a, a again, a rigorous, a rigorous schedule. It does designed, of course, primarily for the monastics, but visitors are invited to participate as much as possible. The visitors are expected to follow certain practices in order to kind of enter into that different way of life. So this, um, there's a strict coat, dress code. So for example, everyone has to wear long sleeves, long pants. Women are always are wearing a scarf over their head out of modesty. The men and women are also separated. So when you go into the church, men stand on one side, women on the other. In the dining room, the same thing. The men are sit on one place, the women sit at separate tables. The guest quarters, they have quarters, they have rooms there for probably two, three hundred people to stay um, all together. And the, the, the men stay in one place and the, or the, the, there are houses for men to stay in and there are houses for women to stay in. Of course, also the monastic diet. They are they, they follow a very strict diet. They fast on every Monday, like we said. They have strict fasting from oil. But this overall thing, again, this this whole atmosphere is there to try to present and give to it, the visitors a taste of the of, of monastic life. Actually, I take that back. It's not there to give the taste. It's there for the monks to experience monastic life. And for those of us who go and thirst for some of that, to also be able to get a taste of that. It has often been described as an oasis in the desert, and I mean that quite literally, both spiritually but also literally. So here's an aerial shot, thanks Google Maps. This is what it looks like of the monastery. If we zoom out, that's what I mean when I say oasis in the desert. So this is just endless miles of nothing. My parents' house is right there. So, and my brother's house is up here. Um, so, this is, this is uh, just a quick overview of St. Anthony's Monastery, and I know that there, Father Matthew's going to be taking some visitors there. If you ever have a chance to visit, I definitely would encourage you to. If you see a guy who looks kind of like me with a big, long, blonde beard, that's my other brother who's a monastic, who's a monk at the monastery. His name is also Ephraim, Father Ephraim. And uh, again, though, of course, you know that this is not the only monastery that Elder Ephraim founded. I... I think that part of the reason Father Matthew asked me to, to talk a little bit is part is because I have the, a close family connection. I also spent three years myself as a novice in the monastery here at the top, which is Holy Archangels outside Candelia, Texas. Um, and how can we talk about the monastery without with monasticism without uh, a shout out to Goldendale and our, our, our local convent here in, in, in St. John the Forerunner near Goldendale. So, um, I'm kind of rambling at this point. This was the end of my, my formal talk. I wanted to open it up, and I know that I'm at time. Um, but I wanted to invite if there are any questions about anything, especially for people who may not have visited a monastery before, or may not have, whether it's practical logistics questions about going to, to visit these places, what monasticism is. Um, but I would definitely encourage all of us, because we are called. It, this is a consistent message, not just in the gospel, or sorry, not just in the patristic writings, but in the gospel itself, where we are called to an ascetical life of self-discipline, and the, mon the monasteries are a place for us to go and recharge our spiritual batteries, to be able to see people who live this life day in and day out, and live it even at a much higher level than anything that we can ever uh, really strive to do. So, um, yeah, any questions? Don, it looks like you had one. Yeah, um, and first apology, I wasn't here for the first five minutes, so maybe you said something about this. But is there a connection besides St. Anthony, the Aramidic in the second century? Are we connecting to Israel's and, and to Samson and, and to that kind of? So that's a great question. The, the question is about connection back to even before St. Anthony. So St. Anthony is the first one that we consider the father of monasticism, but there was definitely monastic way of life even before that. The... St. John of the Baptist is, is reviewed, revered by the monks as sort of their patron because he is the one who first lived in the desert as an, an angel in the flesh. The monastics also have the tradition that they are trying to live what they call the angelic life. And this is also why monastics fast on Monday in addition to Wednesday and Friday in honor of the angels whom they are trying to emulate. Um, there's also, if I go back here, straight there. If, I don't know if you caught this, but in the icon of St. Pacomius that I included, there is, it is an icon of an angel dressed as a monastic 
who actually appeared to St. Pacomius and said this, gave him basically a list of this is how you ought to dress, this is how you ought to live, this is how you ought to behave, this is what your daily rules should be. And it was this, it was actually that St. Pacomius thought it was just another hermit from the desert talking to him. And he was like, you know, getting all of this information, okay, okay. And then as he was, stand, as he was trying to write some of this down, I don't remember the exact thing, so I, so I shouldn't go there. But at some point, the, the visitor disappeared and he realized this was actually an angel communicating with him. So there is the connection to the angels. There's con connection to, um, to St. John the Baptist. Even further back, if we look in the prophets and we look at the time of Elijah, Elijah was also uh, celibate, and there's reference in those days to the groups of young men that were called the sons of the prophets living separately. So the patristic, uh, the patristic understanding is that these were also um, quasi pre-monastic things. All right. Um, yeah, if anybody has children in Sunday school, it is time now to, to get them. So I'm not trying to kick you out, but anyway. Yeah, Maddie. Athos was the name of a, so it's a place name, first of all. It comes from uh, Greek mythology. There was one of the demigods that was named Athos, and he got in a fight, I think, with Zeus, and Zeus, like, picked him up and threw him and turned him into stone as he, like, hurtled through the air and then he landed on the ground, and so that's, so Mount Athos was originally, um, you know, supposedly it was the, the petrified uh, anti, uh, you know, one of Zeus's enemies. Yes? The nun that came from Greece to found to be Golda. So yeah, so there were three nuns that originally came there. You know, you said Praxia, who is who is still the the abbess there, and then she had two sisters with her, two nuns, sisters Agni and Parthenia. So all three of them are still there. If you ever get to go to the monastery, there you you can meet them. Um, so they came from a convent outside Volos, a city in Greece, in a little town called Portaria. And this was one of three monasteries in Greece that when Elder Frank came to America, they had been under his spiritual guidance. And he spoke with the abbesses of these three monasteries and with their, their help, they selected nuns to come and start the monasteries here. And so Jerónimo said Praxia and the, the sisters Agni and Parthenia are the ones that, that came here to start Old Hill. Sure. I believe this weekend of May 5th, there's going to be a women's retreat at Bolandale, so look out for more information. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much, Robert. This is a very